Hello and welcome to KingstonCitizens.org's Roundtable, What's the Process? We're recording each week and broadcasting uh, a program that tackles local city of Kingston and Ulster County topics with a range of guests. Uh, this week I am joined by one of our co-hosts. Um, my name is Rebecca Martin and I'm the director of KingstonCitizens.org. And I'm Jennifer Schwartz-Berkey. I am an urban planner and a uh, co-founder, uh, advisor, supporter of Kingston Citizens and serve one term as an Ulster County legislator. Yeah, and tonight we don't have Lynn. She's at home doing some work for her students, so she'll join us uh, uh, at another time. Uh, so Jenny, thanks for being here tonight. Sure. And for those watching, if you would like to learn more about Kingston Citizens, you can visit www.kingstoncitizens.org. We're doing two shows this week. Uh, later in the week, we're going to be discussing pharmaceuticals and other unregulated contaminants in the Hudson and Rondo, Hudson River and Rondo Creek, where we have um, the wonderful Dan Shapley, who is the director of wa water quality, the water quality program at Riverkeeper, who's going to come in and talk to us. There was a report that we um, posted recently that was created by Columbia University in partnership with Riverkeeper um, that spoke of high levels of pharmaceuticals that were um, uh, reported in our, in our outfall. Uh, the highest levels, according to the report, uh, on the Hudson River. But I think that there's more to say about that. There's more nuance. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy that we'll have Dan come on, who I work with too, uh, <laughs> in my other job at Riverkeeper, which I'm proud to say. And Jenny, in the background here, I'm, I've shifted locations tonight because the sun is so bright in the front of the house, but I have a Kevin Paulson uh, painting, which I cherish. It's uh, Kevin Paulson is a city of Kingston um, community member. We're lucky to have him here. Beautiful work. Beautiful work. And it reminds me of my home in Maine, actually, where the walls were all painted by an artist named Rufus Porter, who created murals. Um, mm -hmm. Back at that time, the artists would stay in someone's home and live there and in return paint the paint murals. So it's a little ode to home that he's a very special artist. What were you going to say? Oh, I was just going to say in my background, you, you, you folks will always see my, uh, a small portion of my uh, book collection. This is my study and it, anybody who wants to discuss history, politics, um, power relations, language, um, you're always welcome to reach out to me. Yes, right. You're always welcome to reach out to me. Urban planning, urban history, art history. Uh, these are the topics I love and um, I welcome any informal book club or library exchange. We're so lucky that you're a part of this program to share your wealth of knowledge on so many, so many issues, not only within your trait, your, your expertise, but you have, I know, a voracious uh, learning appetite <laughs> and you know a lot about a lot. <laughs> so tonight- There's A lot more I don't know and that's the sign of a learner. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And that's what it, right, that's the assumption too. There's never, there's not an end to it. Right. And uh, tonight we're going to be, we, we've added an a, a additional show this week because um, there's an important piece of legislation that's on the table. And the evenings, uh, the title of our program tonight is Police Legislation in the City of Kingston. And we have two guests. We have Ward 1 Alderman Jeffrey Ventura Morel, and we have Ward 4 Alderwoman Rita, Rita Worthington. And they're waiting to join us in just a moment. But maybe you can put into context what's happening now um, as we uh, move into more of the granular hyperlocal um, because of it. 
Oh, well, I mean, uh, as, as most people have observed, there are protests in every state. And uh, as in Minneapolis, many elected officials, especially the legislative branch of cities and communities across uh, the, the country, are being expected to step up and um, address the structure of their governments. And in Minneapolis, as people might have heard, nine members of the 13 member city council have uh, declared that they want to defund their police departments. Now that's not what we're looking to do in Kingston, but as um, we're going to talk about in this hour, uh, we've been working not just for the last two years in which uh, this current um, body is, is in session, but we've been working for a really long time on police community relations. Um, in fact, the church right down the street from me is one of the leaders, the New Progressive Baptist Church has been holding discussions regarding the ending of the new Jim Crow, in which we are a nation that has imprisoned more African Americans and people of color and people in general than anywhere on earth. And these questions of powerful relationships is something that has been a discourse in our community for a long time. Uh, it's been discussed in the Ulster County Legislature. We, in the session that I uh, participated in, in 2015, from 2015 and 2016, actually 2016 and 2017, uh, we worked to, to try and shift the balance of power and address questions of um, the relationships of the police, the sheriff to the public. So I don't know if that's enough context for you, Rebecca, but we could also get into that as we talk about these questions in Kingston in the I course of should, our meeting. Yeah, I think that's, that's really helpful. And let's let's bring Jeffrey and Rita in. Do they come? We thank you for our teacher, God. And then as we. Here's Rita. We just um but hmm. so I'm finishing up another call. So let me get out of here and then I'll come to you. That sounds good. Jeffrey, are you there? Yes. Hi. Hi, Jeffrey. Hi, how are hey. you? Great. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Nice so to see everybody. Yeah, I think she's just finished. Let's see. Hi. Hi, Rita, are you finished? I am, I just finished. It was good that I guess we were running a little late because um, I got a chance to stay on this other meeting that I was in. <laughs> That's so the thing about this time. I feel like people are doing more meetings than ever. There's no interruption. It's one after another. Are you yes. experiencing that? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Hi, Jennifer. Me. Hi, Jeffrey. <laughs> I don't know if I said hello. Thank you both. Hi, guys. Us. Yeah. We appreciate you being here. And um, before we begin, I, I wanted to read a little bit about you both. I have a uh, little bios for you. Um, uh -oh. oh, they're all good. We, <laughs> so Rita, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you. Rita, Rita Worthington has resided in the city of Kingston for more than 30 years. And she's starting her second term as Ward 4 Councilwoman for the Kingston Common Council. Thanks for your service, Rita. She also chairs uh, the council's special policing committee, which we're going to focus on this, this evening. Uh, Rita began her legal career in 1996 and received her degree in paralegal studies from Kaplan University. She received her certification in family law meditation, sorry, mediation and counseling. Rita formally served as the commissioner on the Kingston City Police Department, as well as moderator of the community policing forums, Jenny, that you were just mentioning. Um, 
She served on the board of directors for the Kingston City Library, the Ulster County Mental Health Association, and Save Them Now, a re-entry program for returning citizens from incarceration. Rita is a licensed minister at the New Progressive Baptist Church, where she also serves as the chairperson of the trustee board. Welcome, Rita. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Ventura Morrell was born in the Domin Domin Dominican, excuse me, Republic. His mother immigrated to the US when he was a toddler and he was raised by his grandparents. Later, he moved to New York City, became a US citizen and earned a bachelor's degree in art history from CUNY, Hunter College. He settled in Kingston after falling in love with its diverse and welcoming community. We all remember that. That legislation, that memorializing legislation was very wonderful in Kingston, as well as its rich history and natural beauty. Jeffrey is serving his second term on the city of Kingston's Common Council representing Ward 1 uh, and is currently the chair of the Common Council Laws and Rules Committee, which is a significant uh, decision-making committee for, for the Common Council, handling all laws <clears throat> and rules, obviously, and as a member of the Special Policing Committee. So I just would like to dive in. We have a, a, a set of questions that I think are a good starting point. I will say that before we do that, um, you know, Kingston Citizens has been working in Kingston for a long time. And it's primary, uh, the keystone of what we've always done is work with the council. It started that way where we would, we, we started with a Ward 9 meeting back in 2007 uh, to work with our aldermen at the time to bring together constituents in Ward 9. We would take on an issue each month that was relevant in the city and we would be, we'd have a guest who would educate us on the issue. And with our, with our older person present, we would say, okay, we have this information. We'd like you to represent us this way. And so working with the council has been the foundation of what Kingston Citizens does, primarily because there's nine voices and that's democratic right there, right? With the council, there's debate, there's dialogue, um, there's real um, interaction with constituents on a regular basis. So this is where we thrive and it's where we've always preferred to do our work. And so having you tonight is really in, uh, right in, in line with, um, and that's not even the term, it's in, it, it's the heart and soul of what we've always done. And we understand that there's, um, important legislation, policing legislation that's been on the table for a few years and that you've been all working really, council has been working really hard, you know, to achieve the changes that the community has been requesting and all the work and Rita, you've been, you've been engaged in the forums that have been, that have happened at the church where the chief of police and the mayor, several administrations, Shane Gallo, uh, as I recall, w w was a part of these forums. I'm not sure if it was actually occurring during the Sotile administration or not, um, but I certainly have, have uh, know that, that this has been going on for a long time. And I think to, to create a, to, to kind of create context, which we, we did try to provide at the top, Jenny did a great job at talking about, you know, the current landscape. Um, you know, why, why you're both on the policing commi committee for the council. So why is police legislation important for Kingston and Ulster County right now? Uh, and why has it been not only right now, but why has it been important um, for us? And we can focus on Kingston. You can connect the dots to Ulster County. Um, so why don't I let you both take a turn and share your thoughts on that. Jeffrey, you want me to go first? 
Yes, I'll, I'll let you go first. For <laughs> Thank you, the gentleman. <laughs> um, so, so obviously, police legislation um, is right in the forefront right now because of what's going on in our nation right now, right? With the death of George Floyd, uh, particularly his death, Breonna Taylor's death, Ahmaud Aubrey's death. So it's right back in the forefront where unfortunately, um, you know, it, not that it died down, but it wasn't as, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't, not important, but it wasn't in the forefront until this happened again. And um, so that's why it's important because, I mean, I don't have to tell you what's going on. We have a lot of unarmed African-American males being shot by police. And uh, oftentimes there's, there, the police officers are not held accountable for their actions. Now here in the city of Kingston, there have been some complaints, as thank God there haven't been many, but there have been some complaints wherein people have um, you know, told me that they've had run-ins with our police officers and uh, the outcome wasn't that great. And so, you know, like Jeffrey and myself, we're public servants, so are police officers, and we should be held accountable for any misconduct that we do. And unfortunately, law enforcement, enforcement oftentimes are not held accountable. So actually, that, that could, we could go back to 2015 with Fabian Marshall. You know, there was a videotape then, and I, I wonder if, if you could reflect on, and, and I think we should also maybe go to Jeffrey, but I just, just in terms of what you just mentioned, and then we could talk a little bit about the police, policing committee. What do you think has changed in Kingston besides this uh, national sur surge of, um, of voices? Well, you mentioned Fabian Marshall. I think um, even though that was a few years back, mm -hmm. that was really significant. Um, bringing police accountability back to the forefront. You know, um, you know, a lot of people were upset with the outcome of Fabian's, you know, what happened with him. And so that along with some other complaints that have come in um, against law enforcement here in Kingston, just seems as if uh, people feel as if um, you know, nothing is being done about any, any kind of misconduct, whether it be large or small, you mm -hmm. know, it's a general feeling that, um, you know, for lack of a better phrase or term that the, we can't get the police to be, to, we can't hold them accountable for anything. You know, if the, if the position was reversed, if I, or Jeffrey, as a man of color, did some of the things that law enforcement are doing to some of our uh, unarmed black men, males, you know the outcome would be a lot different. Right, right, right. Right, right. and it's unfair. It's unfair. And you know, and let me preface also by saying, and not all police officers are, are bad. Generally, I think most of them are good, right? But you all, you have those that are and they should be held accountable for, and they should not be shielded by the good ones. Right. Yeah. And so the police policing committee, how did this um, come about? How did you folks start the actual committee itself? Well, actually, before we do that, can we have Jeffrey in? Yeah, that's what I was going to, I was, I was hoping Jeffrey would. Um, yeah, I, and just to, to, to rephrase it, we're, we're wondering why police legislation is important in your opinion, in Kingston and in Ulster County in general, too, if you'd like to make that connection. Yes, well, it's it's one of the what basically uh, the Fabian case happened while I was running for, or or it was in its apex while I was running for election uh, the first time around. So it's it was probably the first issue that I. Uh, focused on. Uh, as soon as I got elected, I started having meetings uh, with uh, 
with community organizations. Um, Andrea Schott and I, uh, she's now the council president. We were both uh, rookies at the time, and we both started uh, reaching out and seeing what we could do. I mean, uh, every time I see one of these cases of another unarmed black man uh, losing their lives or, or being harassed or mistreated, I think, well, they're, but for the grace of God go I. Uh, that could have been me. Uh, and so it's something that is always in my mind. And, and now I think uh, it's, it's come to the forefront now and everybody's talking about it because um, George Floyd's, uh, the way his life was taken, unfortunately, it was, uh, as somebody said at the, at the protest uh, the other day, it was a modern day lynching and we couldn't turn away from it. It was, it was too graphic and, and we, it, we, it would just reach the point where we can't ignore this anymore. So I think that's why now is the right time uh, to address this. That is, is admittedly a systemic problem. Um, and, you know, I have, I have family members that are police officers. My grandfather was a retired police officer who raped, raised me. So I'm not saying all police officers are bad, but the ones that are should be held accountable. Yeah, and I think Rita said it perfectly that any public servant needs to, you know, follow the law and the rules. And and when when it when that doesn't happen, we need to also they need to be held to uh, the standards, the high standard that the public expects um, across the board. And and Jenny, thank you for bringing up Fabian Marshall. I'm glad that. You, you brought him into our early discussions and you were introducing the next question. So why don't, why don't you do that? You mean in terms of the police policing committee? Yes. Um, yeah, the role. So, right, right. So we're trying to, we're, what's the process, right? right. The so the just in terms of, in terms of, what is the role of the Special Policing Committee? How and why was it formed? Um, either one of you. And what, what are the goals of the committee? So the uh, Special Policing Committee was formed in January of this year as a result of, um, as I, I believe it was Jeffrey mentioned or, or maybe uh, Rebecca mentioned, that this legislation that we've been working on this for a couple of years now right and um now i w i have not been working on it for a couple of years uh i came in on ja in january Rita, can I just ask you to do one thing i'm realizing the special policing committee is something that's new in 2020 yeah but the city has been the council has been approaching police legislation prior to that so do you mind just walking us through where it was and how um, we got to the the uh, policing, uh, the special policing committee in January. Just to put it into context, because right. we can't assume everybody understands the the steps. And and it, I think it would be helpful to know. Okay. So from from my understanding, from what I understand, um, legislation was introduced by uh, Rise Up Kingston, and um, I guess there was. And Jeffrey, you can help me with this. Um, there were meetings that were being held between Rise Up and members of the council to work on this legislation. Um, as a result, uh, I'm not sure how it stalled or I'm not sure where it went to how we got to the special policing committee because I only, again, I only came in on January, but um, I think that the, the committee was formed to further take a look at the legislation. Um, to research it, to see what elements could be implemented and what elements could not be implemented, and you know, to get community input and try to get this legislation passed. So I'm, I'm missing a few steps as far as two years ago, the beginning when it started, up to that. So I think Jeffrey might be able to fill you in on that. Uh, yes, so I, I can give a little bit of background. I, uh, I, just to, uh, so we were, Basically, Rita was working on it, and we were work, working on it through separate channels. But we, we had 
we hadn't come together to work as a team on it. Um, so how it started uh, with this particular piece of legislation, um, uh, Rennie Scott Childress, Andrea Schott, and I uh, started uh, meeting. We were approached by Rise Up Kingston. I think they weren't even formed as, a, as an organization uh, yet. Were you uh, all on, I'm sorry, but were you serving on laws and rules, the three of you at the time? Yes. So that's why the legislation initially came to you three. Exactly. And, and part and, of a five and, person and, body that yes. is the Laws and Rules Committee, correct? Right. Okay. Right, and, and Rita wasn't on laws and rules on the last term, so that's why we were we were approached with this particular legislation uh, and asked to introduce it. Um, so that we had uh, Rennie uh, Scott Childress went uh, to the Benjamin Center. He's been working uh, directly with Dr. Benjamin and uh, Katie Tobin, uh, researching uh, uh, state law and what what type of organized of uh, legislation we can or cannot uh, implement here in Kingston. Um, there are cer certain um, based on the charter, based on based on the charter and based on uh, state law. So there are certain things that we cannot uh, that due to uh, home rule of 1923, we as a, as the city cannot. Uh, cannot implement here uh, without charter change and um, and without uh, basically the state changing their their laws. Uh, so um, so we were approached uh, first. It was uh, the original idea was for us to look into the into the bargaining process, the union bargaining process, and try to address these changes through the contract. Um, then we found out that the council doesn't have uh, jurisdiction over the contract, that that is the, the jurisdiction, the sole jurisdiction of the mayor. He's the only elected official that sits at the table and makes those negotiations. Um, so then we decided, we started brainstorming based about what, on what the else. Charter or based on state law? Uh, sorry, that, based on the charter, yes. So, uh, so based on the charter, the mayor has the power to negotiate contracts um, as well as um, appoint people to different commissions. Uh, the council has no say in that and, and has no oversight uh, in that, according to the charter. Um, so we, uh, the legislation that came to us initially was to reform the police commission. Uh, then we found we also don't have jurisdiction over that because uh, Anything that we implemented that would take uh, basically the, the mayor's power of appointment uh, would have to go through charter reform. We couldn't address it as the, as the council. Right. So in the charter, it states that the mayor has the, um, the oversight of appointing any members of the board's committees and commissions. Yes. And can remove them at his or her will without exactly. any council oversight. So what, what does that mean in, in the case that you come up against something that requires charter reform, that requires a referendum, correct? Yes. So all the yes. processes that get you to a referendum. So it's not passing an ordinance or something like that. It's a much longer process for the council. So you came it's up a much longer pro Yes, it's a much longer process and it's one that is already on our table at the Laws and Rules Committee. So it's something we are addressing and looking into. We've already started the ball rolling. Uh, we have someone from uh, NICOM uh, coming to uh, present to us at our next Laws and Rules meeting, which is next Wednesday, not tomorrow, the following Wednesday. And the public can watch that on um, yeah. or, or listen in, or whatever. Right? Yeah. Yes. Or to share that. I'm glad to know that. Mm -hmm. I thank you for, for making, I know the whole council has been working towards that. It's a good step, good educational step. So continue. I, I just wanted to give some context to understand that to reform charter is, is not what maybe some people just typically are used to where the council, the committees will pass out, you know, a piece of legislation. It goes to the caucus, to the floor for a vote, and then it's done. That's not... Yeah how i mean it, it that's a part of how it works right but it's it's a referendum pro it's a process of referendum so yes circling yeah. back i'll let you yes so so through researching the process what we found is that a lot of what is included in this um 
we've gone back and forth and made changes and we suggested what we could and could not implement as part of the um, policing committee, uh, the special policing committee. Uh, and uh, the legislation has changed a lot in the two years that we've been working on it and it has taken different shapes from what it started out being. Um, so what it is now is basically a police commission reform. Uh, and what we found through our research is that uh, in the charter, there is nothing that sets the bylaws of the police commission. So the mayor, as the chair of the police commission, already has uh, within, uh, within his power the authority to change the makeup, the procedures, the practices, and the complaint process of the police commission without requiring uh, legislation. Uh, so uh, he's asking her, uh, us for legislation, so we will give him legislation. But I wanted to be clear that he can already change what's being asked of us to change. Right, and that's true for the commissioners too, even though in order for that to, I mean, as it stands, the law allows the mayor to appoint everyone. So even if there's a process in place that's in all inclusive, it can literally be gone tomorrow with a new mayor, right? So it's not, so that's interesting about the bylaws. So, um, so the police commission, I'm sorry, the uh, police, um, the, I've heard different, terms for it, the... It's, it's actually called the Special Policing Committee. committee. Thank you, right. <laughs> we, even, we even call it different names too, so yeah. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thank you, Rita. So, Jeffrey, can you round us out? So you guys have been working on this, you've described as in-laws and rules for many years, and the, poli the special, um, look at me, the Special Policing Committee, was initiated by uh, Council President Schott in January, along with the Housing Committee. I think there were three, right? There was policing, housing, and maybe a third. Is that correct? Um, I believe it was just those two. Those two. I might be wrong. So what was the purpose of creating the Special Policing Committee? And if, I've, if I'm skipping over something important, please take us back. Um, because the public might ask, okay, so it's in laws and rules and anyone, those who follow these processes know that laws and rules is a place for discuss, discussing legislation, not always the best place to vet a law, it's sometimes nice for laws to be worked on before they're put into committee, so that the committee can move more swiftly right to, to pass things through. So it was with, with laws and rules, but it sounds like it was moved out into a sp special policing committee to assist the laws and rules committee. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I decided to move it out of laws and rules uh, and onto the policing subcommittee. Uh, and then I'll let Rita, uh, because she's the chair of that committee, uh, to, to speak to the particulars of that. But the reason I decided to move it out of laws and rules is because uh, the official uh, standing committees are a uh, deliberative um, body. So we normally do not invite uh, the public to present to us. Uh, we are just, the discussion is just for the five people sitting at the table uh, to decide whether to move forward with this legislation or not, or any legislation or not. And uh, what I wanted uh, to do with this particular uh, proposal was to have the community have a voice and have a seat at the table. And, and I thought it would be best to have it as part of the policing committee where uh, people could be in, invited to present to us. We could go out in the community and speak to the, to the main players and to the community leaders that, that would have otherwise not had a voice had we just gone through laws and rules and, and decided amongst ourselves. And I will right. you to Rita. <laughs> right. Well well you basically explained the reason why we um why you moved it to the to the policing committee. And obviously we wanted to move it along. Um it it appeared as if it kind of came to a standstill. 
And so we wanted to, we thought, um, I'm sure President Shout thought that moving it to forming this committee, you know, three people would be able to look at it and uh, analyze it and research it. We would be able to have meetings ourselves or forums or public forums and have people come in and talk to us and discuss it. And we would also be able to meet with the originators of the legislator, le legislation and get feedback, and which we did which we did. And so, um, you know, I think the main reason is to just to try to move this along. And unfortunately, as we were, you know, go taking a look at the legislation, there were some things that, you know, we got caught up in that we didn't know, you know, some of the legislation that was proposed, you know, we really didn't have any power to do anything about that. And, and you know, unfortunately, it halted it a bit. How did you find that out, Rita? What what was what happened? Because you're all working for many months. You're talking to stakeholders. Well, we had um, you know the city's court counsel and uh, assistant court counsel. They also were advising us, and they were too were looking at the legislation as well. And so they knew um, the process, and they knew what could be done and what could not be done. And so uh, we took our cues from them. Right, and so there, there was another forum. I remember this this spring, or was it last fall? Now, Every, time is just so crazy. Where, um, where the mayor, where Chief Tinty attended, uh, where Dave Clegg was a panelist, um, where you gave un incredible comments uh, that were so appreciated in that in that forum. When was that exactly? Do you? Oh, it couldn't have been. It might have been early, like in February or January. Yeah, maybe maybe yeah. January, February. Yeah. What was the what? Who called that forum, and and what was meant to happen during during the forum for the community? What was the purpose of it? Um, actually, I believe that was Alderman Davis that put that forum together, and that was a result of uh, the shootings here in Kingston the um, the uh, shootings that happened a few blocks down the street from me. Um, and so the public was concerned. They were um, concerned about safety issues and Alderman Davis put that forum together. It was right. It was actually in early March, which is uh, just well, set up and it's amazing mm -hmm. because it seems like a million years ago and it was yes. right before we really all got locked down. But there were there have been many forums in the community, um, as I was saying in the introduction before you came in. Um, the New Progressive Baptist Church has been holding meetings for a long time, and I remember going there it's right down the street, and uh, sitting with uh, sitting with the community, and there was it was very vocal and at the same time, um, you know, respectful, but. Mm -hmm emotions were running high and it was going on for quite some this has been going on for quite some time this dialogue mm -hmm. yes jeffrey wants to add something to that uh, yes and also um i believe it was 2018 uh where um before we were the the policing committee we were just calling ourselves the policing coalition uh and uh and we had we co-hosted a series of forums along with Rise of Kingston. Uh, one was at the Maritime Museum, another one was at the church on Pearl Street, uh, and where we brainstormed with the community basically. So a lot of what is included in this proposed legislation were ideas that came out of those forums. So can we talk a little bit about the proposed legislation and you know what what you can do, what we can do versus what we can't do? Yeah, and actually, Jenny, if I can add to that, the legislation did become memorializing. And I'm assuming now, hearing your stories, that it became memorializing because you wanted to do, you were, you were working with the city, you were getting advice from Corp Council, uh, the Assistant Corp Council, and that you realized, and we know because we've read your statement, that there were some real barriers that made it difficult to move this legislation through as is. And so it seems like the memorializing resolution, which is, is um, memorializing, so it's not law, but it's an intention, right? It's the intention to do something. 
So because of the roadblocks that you found throughout the way, did, did, the, did the council decide to go the memorializing route in order to show the community that it was working on something and it was struggling because of the conflicts, uh, the, the executive branch conflicts that had to do with negotiating the police contracts as well as uh, the commission appointments and, um, and, and other matters. So is that, is that why it became memorializing initially? Uh, yes, so uh, in a way, yes, uh, it became memorializing because we realized that um, as a city, um, according to New York State Home Rule Law, we were not a uh, what's called a second class city. And, and that's, uh, Jenny could probably explain that a lot better than I can attempt to. Uh, but what that means is that because of the classification of city that we are, uh, we couldn't enact um, anything that addresses employee discipline that has to be done through the uh, barg contract bargaining process. Uh, so what we decided, uh, and once we realized that the mayor had already, that everything else that was in the legislation, uh, the mayor already had it within his power to enact, uh, we decided to do it as a memorializing resolution, basically um, telling him that th these are the, step we, the steps we wished for him to take. Um, it was it was on the table, ready to be voted on laws and rules, and then we received um, communication from some community members, um, prominent leaders of the, the the main affected communities that that this legislation would uh, address, and uh, they were saying that they had been felt uh, left out of the process, and they wanted their voices heard, and so we decided to put the vote on pause so that we could do a little bit more outreach. And then that's when we got all locked down. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, the, I just wanted to say the, the idea of being a first class or a second class or a third class city, which is what Kingston is considered is solely a function of the size of the population as a more than hundred year old law. And it's pretty arcane actually, if you ask me, because the idea is, that certain cities have more autonomy to manage their own affairs simply by as a as a function of having certain um, kinds of officers and elected offices um, that can make certain decisions and deal with certain issues administratively. So unfortunately, Kingston is at, well, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, because of the size of its administration and its population, it's considered a third class city and has less autonomy in those matters. So. Right, I think the uh, population size has to be 50,000 or more. Right, for be, to be a second class, second class. and mm -hmm. 250,000 to be a third class, uh, first class city. Right. Right. But I think Kingston is a first class city. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good why, all the way. Yeah. So um, can I jump in just a minute there? Um, Absolutely, go for it. Yeah, I, you know, I wanted to, you know, although we were, um, we had to put the legislation on pause, you know, we were able to implement training, which was one of the tenets of the legislation that um, the community asked for, training for implicit bias training for our police commissioners. And so we were able to get that uh, on the table and get that passed. And, um, you know, hopefully once this pandemic is entirely over, We'll be able to go ahead and institute that training for our commissioners. Commissioner also, the city staff, right? It's both. It sounds like it's open to city staff as well. It is open to city staff and is open to any other uh, uh, members of the community that might want to participate. It is. So it's just not solely for the commissioners. But it was um, when acting on the trainer training, our intent was for the police commissioners. Um, in addition. Um, you've all heard of the Peaceful Guardian Project that uh, Lester Strong heads. Right. When was that uh, established? Was that last spring? That was a couple, of, I think it's a couple of years now. Wow. A couple of years ago. And yeah. Lester and I, it was Drew Andrews, I recall, being a part of that. 
process yeah. and uh, who else yep. was involved in that? And what was the purpose of it? What did they come together to do? Mainly it was um, in, our high, in the high school. The program was in the high school and that was to, uh, in effect, introduce the kids to police officers. Um, try to build up some relationship for our, our young people and the police officers to keep them out of trouble. Um, you know, from what I understand, the program is working well. We've had some graduates of the program, and, which is a good thing, <laughs> good thing. And uh, so there was the Peaceful Guardian program. The training was implemented. And, um, you know, we're, we're working on some other things that we'd like to do as far as the commission is concerned. And we're hoping to also get more com community input from significant leaders here in our community that this le legislation mainly affects. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to put something on the mayor's tape, uh, desk as he instructed. I, I wanted to ask a question about the unions and the power of the union um, in terms of transparency, because as you know, the, the call to repeal 50A at the state level and at the national level, the sort of the rising, you know, um, um, calls to create a national database for police misconduct. I'm yeah. just wondering if this is something that could be shut down by the power of the local union, uh, or is it something that could in fact be addressed with your legislation? If, for example, 50A is repealed, obviously in New York State. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yes, well, in fact, uh, we just found out uh, last week that the, um, the model legislation that, that this proposal that we're looking at is based on is uh, Rochester, and that was stricken down by the New York State Supreme Court uh, because it was challenged by the union. And that's why this has taken us so long uh, to work on, because we know that any legislation that addresses uh, minority communities, it's going to be scrutinized doubly as intensely as any other legislation. And we, we, and we want to make sure that whatever we pass is not just symbolic, but it's something that actually, that can actually withstand the, sc the scrutiny that we know uh, it will have. So if, it, if Rochester's was stricken down, um and yours is modeled after this, how are you adjusting in order to avoid that? Well, that's exactly what we're doing, adjusting. Yeah. And, um, you know, as, as Jeffrey mentioned, the legislation that we have before us now, the power, the mayor does have the power and the authority to enact on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so any disciplinary misconduct or actions, you know, that, that part is out of our hands. Right. You know, we, we, cannot, we cannot deal with that at all. And so we didn't want to put forth legislation knowing that, because knowing that it's not going to, to stand, okay. right? That doesn't make sense to do that, mm -hmm. right? So whatever we put forth, we want to make sure that it, it does have an impact and that it's going to work and that it's going to be fair and it's going to be just. And so, um, you know, that said, you know, maybe it's a good thing that we are taking as long as we are to analyze this and to research this to make sure that what we put forth isn't overturned or isn't uh, uh, stricken down. One of the things that I've, I've been reading about, and, and I've, I'm very aware of this anyway, but you're hearing a lot about mayors who are not motivated to take on the PBA, right? The police contracts because, or to make changes that they may or may not approve of because it's politically speaking, it's, it's challenging to an elected official to do that. And yeah. the, the unfortunate part of what's happening in Kingston is that if it's only one elected body, oh, sorry, elected official, there's no, there's no, uh, back up there. It's one voice, which makes it, I, I would imagine, impossible to be able to, I mean, we, nothing I've ever worked on happened because one person did it. It's a, it's a, it's a collective of voices and, 
And it sometimes includes those who some people don't even want to be at the table, but there's times where it really requires it. And most of the time I found that it does. And so do you think that, what do you think in Kingston? I mean, I was listening to the mayor speak of Minneapolis who actually said that very thing as part of one of the, one of the things that he said, and I'm not trying to, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a fact that uh, uh, in a, in, uh, the executive, you know, is involved in these negotiations and there's political challenges to it. Do you think that that's in part that was working against the legislation moving sooner? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's uh, the hardship. The, 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 yeah, the negotiation process and the uh, bargaining process. You know, it's it's not up to us. Well, and know. also, as you both know, you know, I, you've probably gone in front of the union, the panel of um, this committee, when you're running for office to see if they'll endorse you, if you even get the opportunity to do that before they make their endorsements. It's a very powerful thing. Have you been through that experience where you're seeking union endorsement? Um, we've been. I have. I've been through the firemen's union. I don't believe the police union endorses. Mm -hmm. Oh, but there are many unions, and I I think this is an important point that Rebecca's raising because it really does talk about how how does the public uh, um, help offset that in terms of now you know now that there's a lot of public pressure it gives maybe some cover for the mayor to act but it's very very difficult when something doesn't have that kind of momentum right and, and i think that just to that's a good segue because we noticed last week that during the march that the mayor put up a post suggesting that if the council signs legislation and sign it which is welcoming, it's welcome to see, but that has been a long time coming. And it's very clear that when you have thousands of people making the, the demand that that's what I'm talking about. It takes more than one person. It's a collective of people and voices, whether you have a moment like we have now or whether you're working towards something, stakeholders matter and making sure that everybody is there matters. Uh, so, yeah. So you saw last week that that post and I and and the council where the mayor uh, tagged all council members, we saw it too, and we saw several posts that the mayor made and with a change of uh, at least language direction, I do think that the mayor wants, of course, what's best in this case. I, I'm going to make that assumption, um, but it, it was a real like 180 from what we we were seeing, because it, it's been confusing, I think, overall, what's been going on. So, you know, that led the council to putting out a statement that I think I was much appreciated um, uh, by us and to share, and it was encountered by another message by the mayor. And this is sort of the, the, the these are the political processes that really wear down a community um, and make it difficult for us you know, I think the simple is we want to support our council. We want our council members to do their work. Jenny, did you want to? Yeah, I wanted to talk about the one word that was picked up by the news and that was um, sort of the, um, the, the hot button word, which was the use of the word finally. Um, I was, we were wondering about the choice of wording in terms of your uh, press release and 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 there's no doubt I think there has been a, a sense that it's taken a very long time to move toward this but so we were just wondering about that that choice of wording uh, well we worked very hard on that press release so no word that was there was right. accidental um, and the word finally was, was included there because we have already been advocating for the mayor to implement these changes that are within his power to implement. Uh, and, and, and to hear that finally he's agreeing that those changes need to happen, uh, what we're saying is, well, then make them happen. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't need to wait for us to put legislation on his desk uh, for those about to take place. Sorry, Jeffrey, I just wanna add in, you, you learned about his change 
of direction through social media, right? There, yes. Was there a call to council members? To the no, we were actually, we actually felt very blindsided by the comment. Um, I'm happy to see the change of heart and I'm looking forward to working with him on this, but um, a call to the, to the people, uh, especially to the, to the two people of color on this uh, policing committee that have been instrumental in this uh, process would have been a nice gesture. Right, I mean, as you know, this was directly after the march, the rally that we had uh, beginning at uh, Academy Green. Right, like two and hours so, after the post went up, actually. I know yeah, that. So, so coming off of that, which was uh, tremendous and fantastic, coming off of that and then having to go on social media and see that post right. by the mayor, you know, it was a, a kick in the gut, if I, can, if I must say. And, and also uh, and, the, the symbolism of, he may not have realized, but uh, the symbolism of his wording, uh, the the erasure of our uh, contributions to this process and the fact that he was essentially saying we've been lazy, which is a stereotype that has been used against people of color for centuries, right. uh, wasn't lost on, on either of us. Right, right. It was, um, you know, it took it quite insensitive on his part. You have this special policing committee, two people, two persons of color. This legislation, le legislation directly affects us. Mm -hmm. and our family members. And to say that we have been procrastinating um, and, or implying or inferring that we had been procrastinating and that we were not on the ball, um, was, you know, was, um, we were blindsided. And, and to this day, I don't understand why he made that post. Have you actually specifically reached out to ask him? Have, have you been in direct contact at all? Or has he been in contact with you? I think right. that's more appropriate. Right. Uh, <laughs> the day that when we, when I saw the post, um, you know, uh, after my anger subsided a bit, and rather than me uh, going back on so <laughs> social media and doing the tit for tat, I actually sent an email to the mayor asking him to, you know, explain. I did tell him that I was disappointed and uh, to please explain this post. And when I didn't get a response back from him, then I responded to the post on social media. It just indicating that I was a bit perplexed by his statement. And uh, I wasn't sure why he made that statement. And, and it's confusing to the public too, because what I noticed is that that seemed like a big win to the community to have the mayor make a post like that. And if you're not sure. really aware of the sure. nuances here, it looks really good, but you know, circling back to what's the process and where the work really lies is within the council. Right. And I, I you know, KingstonCitizens.org shared your statement and, and, and I was so grateful to have it because it helped us to identify the steps that, that you want to take. Rita is the leader of the policing committee um, with Jeffrey and Rennie on, uh, as part of your team and your colleagues and the whole council as, as your right. team. Um, right. you know, what, what, what we'd like to, to, to do is since that, since the mayor's social media post and your clarification as a body, uh, with, with the council statement, one of the things you mentioned in it was that you wanted to create a community advisory, um, board. Citizen Advisory Board, I think you called it, and it's open to everyone. Um, and this to me is so nice because I know that I, for one, would love to be involved. And I, it's been difficult to know how to get involved or where. And I think the community, um, Jenny, I see you want to ask, make a statement, but I think my, uh, I'll leave it here. I would love to know what, where you both are today, where your colleagues are today, since your statement, and I'm sure you've had conversations in moving this forward, like what are the steps that you're taking? And we can get into at the end, what the public can do to support you 
Um, but it'd be great to just kind of know since your statement has been made, how you are, uh, how you're moving forward now with next steps. Jenny, did you want to add anything to that? Oh no, I'll 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 do it in our roundup, which is approaching. <laughs> so, Rita. so since the statement uh, was released. Um, you know, m myself, Jeffrey, and Rennie, we've been on calls with uh, not only each other, but also with uh, community leaders with uh, regard to forming this advisory board. And, um, and so our plan going forward with that is to just bring people to the table, put the invitation out there. Um, anyone that wants to be participating on this or anyone that wants to be involved in this, please contact us and let us know. We want to put together this board as kind of uh, oversight of the commission and also as a board that can um, recommend to the commissioners and uh, hopefully, you know, they would heed. Now, while the board has no power in and of itself, we're hoping that it will provide some oversight and that um, our commission or commissioners would be open to it. And so we're, we're just, that's our process now. We're just, um, you know, trying to form that and trying to frame that right now. And, and another thing we're hoping is that the, that this board will not only oversee the commission, but will also be in, uh, in constant uh, communication with the council and it's specifically with the policing committee, the special policing committee. Uh, to suggest, uh, based on their observations, uh, to suggest changes that we can make through the legislative branch. So do you, do you both, do you intend to um, put out some sort of a uh, communication to the public about uh, directives as to how people can apply or who they would write to, uh, what exactly they can bring to the table to be supportive of the work? Are you going to have needs like lawyers or you know, other community members, stakeholders, uh, elders, what, what do you, how do you, how do you imagine communicating outward to the community to help them to understand, to, to be in touch with you when the time comes? Those are all excellent suggestions. I think this is something we were just brainstorming a week ago and, and came up with this idea. So it's still, it's still uh, taking shape. Uh, so we don't know exactly what it will look like, but, uh, we're just uh, in the in the beginning stages of, of figuring that out. Right, and the one thing, you know, we wanna make sure that the community has input. Um, you know, I've often heard of the legislation being the people's legislation. Mm -hmm. And so we wanna make sure that we have community output and especially a representation um, of the community that we serve. We also want that on the board and we want those members to be involved with this. This legislation is, while it may affect, um, you know, mostly persons of color, you know, it, in the long run, it affects everyone. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, a right? culture shift. It's a culture shift. It's got to affect everyone, right? Right, right, right. And so, you know, I think our main purpose is to make sure that we have community involvement with this and that we want to make we want to let them know that we hear them and that we understand and that we want them involved and that their voices are important yeah i think also it's a matter of trust so in, in when i um when i think about uh the various committees this is true at the county as well when i think about the various committees that have been pulled together it's so frequently a very small kind of inside track. Uh, people are weeded out very frequently on the basis of whether they might pose a threat to those who have authority or power. And um, this is a very um, this is a very tricky um, tricky situation for uh, at least the um, the elected officials who have a particular agenda. And I just, what I wanted to ha help maybe you think about is that uh, there are a lot of processes that are more participatory than just the sort of committee where you say, okay, so we need a lawyer and we need various people who represent different slices of the community. And 
it ends up resulting in a form of tokenism rather than something that is essentially maybe well facilitated but larger a kind of uh, very often we do this in planning it's called a charrette or a participatory type of meeting um, they sometimes call it a world cafe there's a lot of different names for these events and i think there's a way to do this in which you really do hear if it's well facilitated from more than just those who you pick and choose um so it's worth or talking those about. who have the loudest voice too right that can right. happen also so exactly. do you, you know as we're, we're rounding this off i'd love to hear from you both unless jeffrey did i see you had a, you had something to add actually i thought i saw um, uh, no i just i just wanted to add uh and and taking and uh, going back to what Jenny just said, that that is why, uh, exactly why uh, we put the legislation on hold when it was coming up for a vote, because we want, uh, we don't want one group or one person to to own this legislation. One, if it passes and once it passes, it is everybody's legislation. Right, and it's problematic for one one person to own any legislation. It's an indication that there's potentially a lack of stakeholder input. Right. And that's what I've noticed. I mean, we've done this with the water referendum. You know, we've, when we, when that got passed, it was a dozen organizations that worked together with the council mm -hmm. to get that passed through. And it was in a very short, it was in six months, but there were many, many, many people who had something at stake, who were in, in involved in, in, working that and that that's a very different matter but it was controversial too <laughs> changing the water uh the water powers law that had been in place for around a water board that had been in, in you know in place for 100 years is a big big change so it's it's wonderful your leadership mm -hmm. um in in you know being able to to lead this and to bring more more people to the table um, uh, you're going to have an easier time, I, I think, like we were saying, the more voices and, and the more that people are a part of it and um, taking, uh, uh, um, included, those are voices that you have to help you, you know? Right. And we also want it to be, a, this is an ongoing process, you know, um, police legislation and reform, accountability doesn't happen overnight right and uh you know took a long time for us to finally get to the point where we recognize that something needs to be done mm -hmm. and so these are ongoing conversations this is a long game it's not a short game right because yeah. we want this to continue yeah you know it reminds me of the human rights legislation that i put forward in uh the ulster county legislature and we went through similar uh, maneuvers with the um, the chairman and um, there were a lot of changes that were proposed and it eventually came through and took a long time and there were the reason that it did come through was because there was there were many voices at the table including the the the, the wonderful LBGTQ center um, LBGTQ center of the Hudson Valley um, but it took really bringing a lot of uh, folks to the table and having those open dialogues. And we ended up with uh, a, a significant change to our human rights law in Ulster County. And um, I think the, if you hit the nail on the head, Rita, it can't sit on the shelf. It's like a good plan. You have to revisit it. You have to make sure it's being implemented. Um, you have to keep checking in with stakeholders. And so maybe even building into the law, the requirement for revision and revisiting and even reconciliation. Yeah. So, you know, wrapping up, Rita and Jeffrey, how can we help you? How can we support you? What we meaning members of the public and we, but what can we do now while you are putting together your plan to, um, to help you? Jeffrey, I'll, I'll let you take that. Go first. You, you've been letting me kind of chime in, <laughs> and then I'll come. Okay. Well, um, 
I think uh, one of the main things is to continue to reaching out to us uh, with ideas, with input. Uh, if you want to be part of this uh, community uh, advisory board uh, once we get it together, um, and and to continue to uh, to support us and 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 to uh, you know, ask questions. Um, don't go on, on social media and and, and post. Uh, contact us and ask us what we're doing. Right, um, be careful we'll what you're sharing. Be careful, <laughs> right? You don't need bad lit narratives growing legs, right? Right. So, yeah. So yeah. We can share. And I invite, I invite you all, thank you uh, for you know, allowing us to do this here tonight, but I invite you and the public too to hold us accountable as well. Hold our feet to the fire, mm -hmm. you know, as far as this legislation is concerned and any other issue that may be going on in the city of council, city uh, of Kingston. So hold us accountable as well. Um, you know, that means calls, texts, emails, our, our information is public. And uh, you know, we work for you. We, we are public servants, right? And so, yeah. I love we that. We are so grateful because Kingston Citizens was actually founded on the premise of, um, of this kind of accountability in every ward. Uh, and this was long before there were really even, uh, there was really even much awareness more than 10 years ago, right, Rebecca, where uh, every ward had a little, uh, what was it, a Yahoo group or something like that? Yeah, because every ward is different. Yeah. Every ward right. has different issues. They have right. different, uh, you know, the, the thing, that's why it was so powerful because everyone could organize inside of their ward the way they needed to. And I, I really love what you said, Rita, because it, it's a hardship to, you know, when you're in office, when you're elected into office, it's, it's you know, the public has, tends to sometimes, I mean, there's a distrust mm -hmm. that, that I think better communications can help to fix over mm -hmm. time right. so that there's better etiquette in how community members speak to their elected officials but it becomes very personal for elected officials. They forget that they are elected and therefore they are, they, you know, no one has all of the answers. I mean, the beauty is, is when you bring people together, you find a better solution that way. Mm -hmm. It's not a threat. It's, it's, really, it, it's, it's really about what is your intention. And I appreciate your point of view, Rita, so much, and I am very grateful for your leadership here and your your leadership uh, in general, and your willingness to run for office uh, and to represent your constituents, which are not only in your ward, but you represent me too, as a community member. And Jeffrey and Rita, I thank you so much, and we will continue to follow this and to do everything we can to share the good information that the council puts out and support you to move this forward as swiftly as we can and as correctly as we can to get this right so people are protected. Right, right. You have thank, you. thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you both. That was great. That was so nice of them to come on and, and uh, help us to reset where we are in a, in a productive and productive manner. I mean, right now more than ever, we, we need good leadership like Rita's um, and uh, guidance so that we can be effective. I mean, what, what are your parting thoughts after that conversation? Oh, oh I'm just so grateful that uh, Rita, Jeffrey, and uh, others on the Common Council have stepped up, you know, it's really changed over the last, uh, you know, five to 10 years, the, the representation we have, and it's much more uh, representative of an inclusive Kingston. Um, <laughs> that's my bedtime alarm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, I think that, I think that what's happening is a real shift in the way people are thinking about the role of power, not just as a question of who has the authority and who, who has the right to, uh, make a declaration versus the public taking that power by using their voices 
And I think it, I, I hope that it also represents a shift in the way our elected representatives outside of the executive branch see their role uh, in, in, in bringing the voices of their constituents to, um, as a power to yeah you know i keep i keep wondering how this could work better you know like you have your executive branch the mayor you mm -hmm. have your legislative branch your council mm -hmm. members right mm -hmm. so the mayor has initiatives mm -hmm. that he or she wants to see addressed in the city mm -hmm. those initiatives i'm just popcorning are brought to the council the council then takes those ideas and works within their wards takes that information out to the constituents to discuss to bring back to form a strategic plan to right. figure out that sort of back and forth kind of like yeah. the like the tide of figuring out how you know what are your long-term goals what are the short-term goals and why and working in that way rather than this sort of false yeah, for, of the executive branch to say, this is what I this is what I want to happen, and to co-opt, and it's right. not just this administration. You've seen it over time. It's this everywhere. We are just a microcosm of what's happening everywhere. It's a sort of jockeying for power. It's uh, wanting to claim the credit. Uh, it even happens within a party, uh, between parties in the legislatures. And um, it's, it's unfortunate that rather than it being about the public good and the common good, it turns into who, who secures their position for the next term. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's at every level of government. So, so every level of how we address that. I know, and it's a real puzzle because I think it's, I don't want, you know, I sometimes hear people giving up, you know, on Democrat. On, I think, I don't think people really mean it because I think if people were to live in a place that was not democratic. They would never just flippantly suggest that, you know, it's not working. It's it's but, working as much as we want it to work, right, Jenny? But something is definitely broken. It's broken at every level, or we wouldn't have this exertion um, at the federal level, at, at least, of so much executive power that the Congress is just cowed into either submission or, um, resignation and i i think the answer does lie somewhere in the social pol political realm i mean look it shouldn't take people having to go into the streets after these horrific deaths which we know are just the tip of the iceberg um for this for this kind of sea change to happen this is a moment where we should reevaluate whether or not, for instance, the use of transparent mechanisms is something we're going to push harder for, whether it's a police database or any database for that matter. It's not about, um, it's not about just privacy, let's say, personnel records. It's about what they're doing in the public sphere. Um, and not just them, but for instance, any, political decision that gets made. It's supposed to be for our benefit. This is for our good. Yeah, it's and not so, a private business. Yeah. It's not a private business. Or well, a unfortunately, <laughs> it has been. Well, I know. And I think, you know, we're, uh, I don't know. I, I, you know, believe in our processes. I am, you know, grateful, as I said, to the leadership that we have inside of Kingston at the moment on the council with Rita, with Jeffrey, with Rennie Scott Childress. Mm -hmm. And um, I encourage them to continue to communicate and for the public to participate. And I, mm -hmm. I think it's a, I think a lot has happened in the last week that's been, it's probably moved the needle more than it's been moved in, I don't know, 50 years. <laughs> Uh, is he right? Unfortunately, this so. is the last great civil rights legislation. Yes, in right. housing. Yes. So, nineteen sixty-eight. Right. And it took another terrible death for that to happen. Yep. Martin Luther King. So, I no. think it's very important for us to think about that context. That it's taken how many years? Yes, it's taken fifty years. Right. For this kind of mobilization to happen again.
right and this is not uh, this is not just this is not our summer of love this is a different kind of summer this is a summer of accountability let's leave on that note well said jenny hmm. jenny thanks for joining me and us and being a part of this program thank um, you much appreciated and we'll see everyone next time thanks for joining us thank you